MedCram. MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Today, we're going to talk about why it seems in general COVID deaths are going down, but despite this, excess deaths are going up. There's been a lot of talk about this, and we're going to look at the data and see where it leads us. In the UK, you can see that the dotted black line represents the five-year average, and the red above it represents the official COVID-19 deaths. Above that, we're seeing this blue other excess deaths. And the question is, is what is causing this increase? You can see here these white dots are bank holidays, and so the reporting is not completely in. And I think it's an interesting discussion. We have talked about this before, but today we're going to go into a little bit more depth and do a deep dive. But who are we? I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. This is MedCram. We are a continuing medical education website. I am quadruple board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary diseases, critical care medicine, and sleep medicine. We make educational videos for healthcare providers, which are published online and also by many other publishers around the world. I'm on the faculty at two Southern California medical schools, and I'm always interested in an apolitical discussion of the data and see where it leads. We're not sponsored by vaccine drug makers. And you can verify this on the open payment system by the CMS, which is available at that website. In fact, you can check out anybody who's a physician in the United States and see how much money they're being paid by pharmaceuticals for consultation and other things. At MedCram, on our YouTube channel, we've talked about a number of things, including light as medicine, the use of water, hydrotherapy, sauna. And so we certainly have talked about a wide range of things that could be useful in not only treating COVID-19, but also optimizing your health. So without further ado, let's get down to the data. And I pull this data from our World in Data, which does a very good job at listing the data from many, many different countries. And what we're looking at here is the United States. And they've broken it down into different age groups, age 0 to 14, 15 to 64, and so forth. And here at the end, they have all ages combined into one. And the first thing you'll notice is that the all ages group looks very similar to the elderly, those that are 85 plus and 75 to 84. And that's because most of the people dying are in that age group. But what you can see already here in the youngest age group at 0 to 14 is that we are actually at negative excess mortality. For 15 to 64, we're at zero at this time. But for those in the older groups, like 65 to 74, there's been a slight upturn here in late 2022. You can see here in the 75 to 84, we're well above what's normal. Same thing here in terms of the 85 plus. So when you put it all together, you can see that even though excess mortality was decreasing, there's been an increase as of late, at least in some groups. And some have made the argument that we should be in a negative excess death situation because a whole host of people that were susceptible to dying just died in the last two years. And so, if anything, there should be a pause on how many people are dying. And some people use the analogy of the apple tree that gets shaken. So if there's a number of apples on the apple tree that are ready to come off, the analogy of dying, and you shake that apple tree, there should be a number of apples that fall to the ground. And you would expect that there's a constant rate of apples falling from a tree as they become ripe. So you'd expect that as the apple falls from the tree, you've sped up all of those apples that would fall perhaps in the next couple of days, that for the next couple of days, you should have a paucity or a small amount of apples that are falling. And that would be the case if that shaking of the tree only affected those that were ready to fall. But where the analogy may break down is if, in fact, shaking the tree would also speed up the ripening of the other apples, in a sense, so that they would now be ready to fall just as quickly. So the question is, is that actually what's happening? In other words, did COVID-19 only speed up those that would have died? Or did COVID-19 not only speed up those that would have died, but also made those that were healthy more sick? Because if it made those that were healthy more sick, then potentially we may not see a reduction in all-cause mortality or in excess deaths. And we're going to look at that data as well. Here we see the same breakdown for the United Kingdom. And whereas before we saw a negative excess death in this age group, we're now seeing a positive in the UK. In fact, we're seeing positive basically across the board in all age groups, and it is increasing and certainly a concern as to exactly what it is that's happening at this point in the United Kingdom, but not just in the United Kingdom, actually but also we're seeing it in the Netherlands. And we'll talk more about the Netherlands as well. We do see a lot of jaggedness here in this age 0 to 14 because they have so few deaths normally. But in just about every age group, there is not only a positive excess mortality, but it seems to be on the increase here as of late 2022. What exactly is going on in these countries? 
we're going to talk about three potential reasons why this excess mortality may actually be occurring. First one we'll talk about is cancer. The second one we'll talk about is cardiovascular events, and then finally, vaccines. And we'll go through the data on all of those, and you'll see why I've come to the conclusion that I have based on the data. But even more importantly, I will tell you ways of falsifying the theory that would make me believe the opposite. So I think that's important, is whenever you come up with a conclusion based on the data, you should also be able to say, yes, but if the data were to show this, for instance, then I would change my opinion on the matter. It's always important whenever you're listening to somebody or listening to an opinion to make sure that they're able to tell you how their theory or how their conclusion could be falsified. In other words, what evidence would there need to be to be able to say, therefore, I will change my mind if I see X, Y, or Z. So we'll go through all of that. Let's take a look at cancer deaths first in terms of the pandemic. And this looks at the elephant in the room, if you will. Here's an article that was published by Dr. Carrie Adams quote, why are we not talking about cancer deaths due to COVID-19? Here's the data. From March 1st, 2020 to April 18th of 2020, the U.S. saw an estimated 46.4% decline in the average number of newly diagnosed cases of six of the most common types of cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, esophageal cancer, gastric, lung, and pancreatic. So we're not talking about a decrease in screening. We're actually saying, hey, we diagnosed almost half of the cancer cases that we would normally see. Now, of course, nobody is going to say that all of a sudden during a pandemic, people are going to get less cancer. In fact, the opposite may be true. But if you look here in the United States, why would it be that we're diagnosing cancer less often in 2020? And it's because obviously during the shutdowns, we can see here for breast cancer screening, people did not go in and get their mammograms. And of course, after the shutdowns ended, there was a rebound and people went in to go in, but it wasn't commensurate with the drop they had seen before. And furthermore, there was a reduction in breast cancer screening volumes thereafter. I see this even in my clinic today, that people are not really wanting to come in to see the physician, whether that's because they're afraid they're going to get COVID or whether it's because they've had distrust in the whole medical system completely just in general. It's hard to say. The fact of the matter is that there is less screening going on at this point. Colon cancer screening also, you can see a huge drop here, which is what we would expect during the shutdown and again here. But then overall afterwards, there was no rebound here for colon cancer screening. They say here, and unsurprisingly, the drop in screenings has also meant a sizable drop in new cancer diagnoses. One study comprising of 800,000 patients receiving testing at Quest Diagnostics found almost a 30% decline in new diagnoses of eight common types of cancer, including prostate, breast, colorectal, and lung, during the first three months of the pandemic, although the number of newly identified cancers approached pre-pandemic levels in the summer of 2020, they fall again in the fall of 2020, remaining significantly below pre-pandemic levels through March of 2021. That, of course, could be because the people that would have normally been diagnosed with cancer died. That's a possibility. But nevertheless, 50% reduction in one case, and here 30%, is far above the amount of people that actually died of COVID-19. Remember, the United States has 300 million people plus, and about a million people died, which is a sizable amount, but is only one-third of a percent of the population. So the real question is, is this actually translating into actual mortality? And the answer is yes. This is a paper that was published with the American Society of Clinical Oncology titled Changes in Cancer-Related Mortality During the COVID-19 Pandemic in the United States. So they found that the number of cancer-related deaths in 2020 was 686,000, which was actually up 3.2% or 19,768 deaths. That's compared to back in 2019, when the number of cancer-related deaths was only 664,888. And if you actually look at the annual age standardized cancer-related mortality rates in terms of per 100,000 person years, there's been a decrease actually from 2015 at 173, in 2019 at 162. And then here, as you can see in 2020, it jumped up at 164. So when they did a deep dive on these cancer-related deaths, they found that cancer-related monthly mortality rate was higher in April 2020 when healthcare capacity was most challenged by the pandemic, subsequently declined in May and June of 2020, and the higher mortality rates were again observed each month from July to December 2020 compared to 2019. Now, where was this the biggest? 
in large metropolitan areas, the biggest cancer-related mortality was observed early when the pandemic was there early. And in the rural areas, it was more towards July to December of 2020 when COVID had spread to those areas. It seems to be that these cancer-related deaths are associated with inability to get to medical facilities. They say that cancer-related mortality rates were lower from March to December 2020 in medical facilities, hospice facilities, and nursing homes or long-term care settings, but higher in the people who died's homes. They were dying at home, in other words, unable to get to a facility. This is here in the United States. We clearly saw this. One thing I should make mention of here is that at least in the medical care setting that I worked in, we made a tremendous effort to try to get people in to see physicians, to get their screening. I know of a lot of clinics that were doing this, not just out of the goodness of their heart, but also because they were financially incentivized by the government to make sure that their patients were getting well health checks and getting their screening because part of their reimbursement from Medicare Advantage and HCC codes is based on diagnoses and getting patients in to be seen. Now, that's unique to the United States. I don't see that happening in other countries like uh, Great Britain and other socialized medical countries where there isn't that incentive. Of course, every system has its advantages and disadvantages. And what I'm saying in this case is that one of the advantages with this system is that there is a financial incentive to have the patient go to see the physician, where that may not be the situation in other countries. If we look at other countries, for instance, in the United States, we said there was a 46.4% decline in the number of newly diagnosed cases of six of the most common types of cancer. In the UK, that was an 80% decline. So referrals for suspected cancer of over 80% reduction while restrictions were in place. In New Zealand, there was a 40% decline in cancer registrations compared to 2018 to 2019 during the shutdown. So you can see here clearly there was a reduction in not only the diagnosis of cancers, but also screening. Screening is detecting cancers very early, and that can have mortality rates that increase over four or five years. So we measure lung cancer mortality, for instance, based on a five-year mortality. And generally speaking, it's about a 20% five-year mortality if no chemotherapy is done. So all sorts of people at all different phases of cancer were being missed during this period of time ostensibly. And so that's going to have some effect down the road of increased cancers. And we just showed here in the United States, at least, that there is already evidence of that. Let's go to the UK in terms of cancer. We see here oncology research, this paper that was published in the British Medical Journal titled Estimated Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Cancer Services and Excess One-Year Mortality in People with Cancer and Multimorbidity, Near Real-Time Data on Cancer Care, Cancer Deaths, and a Population-Based Cohort Study. What's interesting about this was they looked at a number of different hospitals in the UK. What was the two-week wait here on the left side of the screen? And what was the amount of chemotherapy that was administered here on the right side? This is over the period of a year. You can see the dates down here, 2019, and then going to 2020. Of course, this is right here where we started to have the shutdowns, the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus worldwide. And then what we do is we zoom up and look into here exactly what happened. Obviously, there's going to be a spike that's down here. This is a bank holiday, so people aren't going in for their oncology appointments. So we would expect that, and we expect to see that every year. We saw it back here as well in the year prior. But what's not to be expected for the two-week wait time for a clinic is for this to drop here. So we see it drop here in a number of different hospitals. This is in Leeds. This is in Royal Free. This is in UCLH. And this is in Northern Ireland. And what you can see here is that there is a drop in the access to that healthcare. We also see a similar drop here in terms of chemotherapy. So there was less chemotherapeutic agents that were administered during that time. That's either people who have cancer and not getting their chemotherapy or people who are no longer being diagnosed and therefore they're not needing chemotherapeutic agents. But you can see that clearly in this situation and it's happening in the early portion of 2020. And so obviously if you're making less diagnoses of cancer and you're treating those cases that you do have with less chemotherapy, the understanding is, is that there's going to be a disturbance in the number of people that are dying from cancer. So that's one of the explanations here. This is another paper that was published in The Lancet, this time looking in Peru. They say our results suggest that COVID-19 controlled measures like lockdowns, physical distancing, and isolation of symptomatic patients alongside the overwhelming strain on the healthcare system had a detrimental impact on cancer mortality in Peru. So this is something that's global and is going around.
We talked about the excess mortality rates that were going on in Europe, specifically the UK. We also brought up Belgium as well and the Netherlands. It would make sense that the countries that have the highest cancer rates should see the highest amount of excess mortality if, in fact, the excess mortality is related to those cancer rates. So here's an article looking at the statistics in Europe, and it looks as though the top three countries in Europe that have the highest cancer rates is Ireland, Denmark, and the Netherlands. If we look at those, it seems as though that those three have the highest excess mortality in terms of the data at this point. Now, of course, that's a big assumption, and we're not saying that all of this excess mortality is related to cancer, as we're going to talk about. There's cardiovascular, and we're going to talk about vaccine as well. But it's definitely a potential cause, so it might make up some of the excess deaths that we're seeing here. Obviously, if we didn't do a good job of catching cancer, which is what we do with screening, then there's going to be consequences down the road. A lot of talk has been made about how excess deaths seemingly are in just about every country of the world. And I found this analysis to be very interesting. We're kind of going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about the sun and light and what that might affect in terms of northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. As you can see here, in the northern hemisphere, I put together a number of countries here in Europe that are towards the polar regions, if you will. Since July, which is like right around here to December, generally speaking, there has been an increase in the amount of excess deaths. I think you can see that there. And in fact, this is a baseline where we absolutely know that in general, if we look at all deaths, people usually get worse towards the end of the year. And so the point is, is that this is also the time of year where the sun is the lowest in the northern hemisphere, and we're getting the least amount of sunlight. And we've talked about that before here on the MedCram channel as well. Shortest day of the year, of course, is around December 21st. So the question is, is, are we seeing the same trends in the Southern Hemisphere, where, of course, at this very same time of the year, the day is the longest? That's the question. So when we look here at some major countries that are in the Southern Hemisphere, countries like Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, these are countries that are similar to the ones that we're talking about in terms of GDP. You can see here that since July, which is around here, which, of course, is in their winter, there's been a decrease in the excess mortality, which is interesting. Which brings us to our next topic, which is cardiovascular. So let's dive into this. So the thing that you've got to understand is when you're looking at excess deaths, it's looking at the baseline because the baseline of deaths that we would experience in a given year is very interesting. Notice here, we have the deaths that we would normally see from heart disease here in purple, cancer here in a lighter purple, here we see it with chronic lower respiratory diseases, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, influenza, and kidney disease. And what you'll notice here is that at the ends of every year, which is approximately when the sun in the northern hemisphere is the lowest in the sky, that's when we're seeing the highest amount of mortality. That's the baseline that we're seeing. The excess death is on top of that peak. But clearly, you can see here that on a yearly basis, the most amount of deaths that we're seeing are at the end of the year slash the beginning of the year and not in the middle. In other words, during the winter months. And the majority of them are due to heart disease and cancer. And this gets back to our analogy regarding the apple tree. One of two scenarios, is it possible that COVID-19 simply shook the tree and the apples fell and none of the other apples became more likely to fall after that, in which case we would see a negative excess mortality? Or was COVID-19 not a tree-shaking phenomenon, but rather a ripening acceleration so that those that were ready to fall fell, but the other apples that were not ready to fall became more ready to fall? If that's the case, then we would not expect to see a negative excess mortality. And I believe the latter is the case. And that's based on this article that was published in Nature titled, Heart Disease Risk Soars After COVID-19, Even With a Mild Case. So we're looking here at not apples that fell off the tree. We're looking at, obviously, apples that are still on the tree. But as you can see here, according to the baseline in this figure 12, over the next 12 months after even a mild infection with COVID-19, what we're seeing here is an increased risk of all sorts of cardiovascular diseases, diseases like stroke, TIA, atrial fibrillation, sinus tachycardia, ventricular arrhythmias, atrial flutter, pericarditis, myocarditis, acute coronary disease, myocardial infarction, ischemic cardiomyopathy, angina, heart failure, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, cardiac arrests, as you can see 
see here, cardiogenic shock, as you can see here, pulmonary embolism, deep venous thrombosis, and superficial vein thrombosis, all related to people who have had a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this was a large study. This was not small. This is 11.6 million subjects that were included in this study, both controls and those that had been infected. This is the most common cause of death in the United States. It's cardiovascular disease. And a lot of ways of picking this up very simply is with an EKG. And we've talked about EKGs and EKG watches. And for those that are interested, just to make sure that you're aware on our website, medcram.com, we have a great EKG, ECG interpretation explained clearly so that you can be facile at interpreting someone else's EKG or even your own if you've got one of those watches. But getting back to our question at hand is why would these countries in the Northern Hemisphere be experiencing an increased excess mortality even though COVID deaths are going down? Well, we've already discussed cancer screening issues, but what about cardiovascular disease? Is it possible that COVID-19 caused a number of people that would not have had cardiovascular disease to have excess cardiovascular disease and therefore be more susceptible to dying, especially in the winter months? as shown right here, because people with cardiovascular disease are more likely to die of cardiovascular disease in the winter months. Well, there's an interesting study that was done titled Associations of Outdoor Temperature, Bright Sunlight, and Cardiometabolic Traits in Two European Population-Based Cohorts. So again, we're looking at the Netherlands and we're looking at England, the same two countries that we looked at. And what they found is when they drew blood tests on 6,671 in the Netherlands and 7,185 in England, they found that the more sunny days they had in the previous seven days before they drew the blood, the better their outcomes in terms of glucose metabolism and lipid metabolism showing that the addition of sunlight can actually have improved cardiovascular outcomes as measured by the surrogate of glucose metabolism and lipid metabolism. And I find that's interesting when we see these increased amounts of death from cardiovascular disease exactly at the time right now when we're seeing excess mortality. Again, this is the baseline that we measure against and what we're seeing is an increased baseline. Could it very well be that the proportion of people in the UK, in the United States, that have cardiovascular disease has increased? I think that's definitely a possibility, especially with what we know about COVID-19 and its effects on the human body. And I just wanted to make clear again that what we're seeing here in the Southern Hemisphere is we're actually seeing a reduction in excess deaths, which would be consistent with this idea that the excess deaths that we're seeing are related to a natural phenomenon that we would see normally, maybe to an excessive amount. And I was happy to collaborate with Margaret Scutch on a paper that was published titled A Geographical Approach to the Development of Hypotheses Related to COVID-19 Death Rates, where we actually looked at epidemiological data and also geographic data that seemed to show in countries with elevated BMIs that the COVID-19 mortality rates were related to latitude. And that actually, this is not the first time this has been seen. We also discussed this in our video, Light as Medicine, Vitamin D is Not Enough. So I think these are possibilities. Let's go on to the third one, which is vaccines. If we look at what's happened, at least in the United States, in terms of daily SARS-CoV-2 infections, daily vaccine doses, and excess mortality, there's an interesting story that comes across here. And again, this is where we get into talking about theories. So here in the first graph, we see daily SARS-CoV-2 infections as measured by laboratory data. So we're looking at PCR. And you can see here that in the early part of the pandemic, we did not have a lot of testing. So it's likely that these are underestimated. But when we did have the ability to check this in the first wave back in the beginning of 2021, we can see that there was definitely an increase. We were getting about two to 300,000 cases a day. And of course, we weren't catching all of those cases, but we were catching some of them. And and with the systems that we were using, there was a certain amount of cases and also the shape of this wave, which I think is important because what we get here is something called a dose response curve. In the population, there's a dose of SARS-CoV-2 infections that are measured here. And if we look roughly at the same time when we measure up excess mortality, there's a bit of a two-week difference because there's the natural history of how the virus actually kills somebody over a couple of weeks. You can also see, as there is three different waves or bumps here, you can also see those three different waves here. And there's a dose response curve here as well, which matches up pretty clearly. For other subsequent waves, like the Delta wave, 
there is a wave. And how do we measure these excess mortality deaths? These are just basically deaths that happen more than we would have expected based on the deaths that we see prior to 2020. These have nothing to do with what the physician puts on the death certificate. This has to do with the fact that there actually just is a death certificate. It's very, very difficult to put somebody in the ground without a death certificate. So this is pretty raw data. It's pretty hard to fudge on these numbers. Here's the Omicron wave, and here's the Omicron death wave as well. Interesting, you can see the Delta wave, how relatively small it was to Omicron, and yet they had about the same amount of deaths, owing to what some people would say would be the reduced mortality of Omicron. And so what we see here is a series of dose responses. SARS-CoV-2 causing excess deaths, SARS-CoV-2 causing excess deaths, SARS-CoV-2 causing excess deaths. And as we can see here, the amount of cases is very low. We put in daily vaccine doses. What I've done is I've flipped this upside down so that this is zero here at the baseline. And you can see here that this was the day where the most amount of people were vaccinated in a single day, and that's at around 3.5 million. So the question is, is whether or not vaccines could be causing excess mortality. Just like I would see here with the dose response curve of the spike protein from the virus, we see here based on about 300,000 that we're able to measure anyway, we see this kind of a dose response curve in terms of excess mortality. Here, what we're seeing is a level, again, I flipped this upside down so you can see it a little bit better perhaps, 3.5 million. That's 10 times the dose of this spike protein. So here we're injecting a vaccine with the spike protein that's in 10 times the amount of people. And I'm not seeing a dose response curve. So what I would expect to see if there was a dose response curve to this vaccine, at least acutely, is I would expect to have seen something like this if the vaccine was causing excess deaths, at least acutely. I would have expected to see something like that. But I'm not seeing it. And that's why I come to the conclusion that I don't believe that the mRNA vaccines, at least acutely, are causing excess deaths. It could very well be that they are causing it slowly and over a period of time. And if that's the case, then we should see that eventually. But at least at this time, the excess deaths, as we mentioned, in the United States are actually going down. I don't like to just take one piece of data. This is the Society of Actuarial Research Institute. And what they did here is they looked at states in particular and what the excess mortality was in that state. And then they plotted it out on the x-axis about the percentage of the population that was fully vaccinated. For instance, here is a state right there that was over 60% vaccinated and had 0% excess mortality during July through September of 2021. And as you can see here, as the fully vaccinated rate starts to go down, what we see here is excess mortality going up. And they actually color code it here so you can see that the red is the southeast of the United States, that the west is green, that the northeast is blue, and the Midwest is in light blue. What's interesting is when you look at the same data, except now you're looking at it later in the year from October 21st through March 2022, what you'll notice is that the states in this area have as a group slightly increased and the groups in this area have slightly decreased. And you can see now that this line is much flatter. And what is that saying? It's saying that the advantage that those states that had a higher vaccine group seems to be disappearing, and the disadvantage that the unvaccinated states in general, that disadvantage is also disappearing. What happened between July through September of 2021 and October 21 of March 22? Omicron. Omicron was a highly infectious virus that didn't cause as much mortality as Delta, for instance. And what I believe it did is it simply evened out. So in other words, these states here, which had less vaccinated population in them, made up for that by post-infectious immunity. So they had T cells that were able to recognize the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and so mortality levels went down. If the vaccines were causing excess mortality, what I would expect is instead of having a slope going like this, I would expect to have a slope going like that. This is exactly what I would expect is a leveling out. And I, in fact, I believe that there will be a continued leveling out. If in fact, the vaccine does cause mortality and we see it down the line, then what I would expect to see is this graph start to look more like this. We'll see if that actually turns out to be the case. So if we do see that, then I think that would be evidence that the vaccine is causing harm in the long run. If we do not see that, if we see this level out, in other words, and stay level, then I think that goes against that theory.
The other thing that I'd like to point out is that we talked about cancer deaths, cardiovascular deaths, and the vaccine, but there's a whole host of other things that are happening under the surface that I wouldn't want to leave out. There's a whole bunch of other things that could be happening. And this is from a Bloomberg article. When you look at the deaths per 100,000 population in ages 15 through 34, even before 2020, even before the pandemic, which started right here, you could see that external causes of deaths in this age population was already starting to go up. Now, what could that have been from? There is an epidemic in our country of fentanyl overdose. We have suicides and accidents, and you can see here specifically the causes that we're talking about, the 10 leading causes of death in this age group. Accidents, suicides, homicides. It was COVID-19 in 2021. This doesn't show 2021. That's going to be in this area right here. But you can see that that was a significant cause as well. But diseases of the heart, malignant neoplasms, chronic liver disease, diabetes, pregnancy, congenital abnormalities, and chromosomal anomalies, much smaller than that. But you can see here that in terms of external causes and internal causes of COVID-19, they were already starting to go up even prior to the pandemic. This doesn't answer everything, but this is looking at the data and coming up with theories and also being able to recognize that there are things in our theories that could be proved wrong if the data goes in one way or the other. So I hope that this has been helpful in terms of a deep dive looking at excess deaths. For me, the biggest take-home message here is right now, if we want to have lower excess mortality where we are living, we should do the things that are happening in Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, and that is get out more into the sun. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications and join us at medcram.com.